Yeah, good morning everyone. Is everything fine? Audio visual fine there? Right. So, uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, myself, Dr. Pranit. I am an ENT surgeon. I practice at uh, Uppal, Hyderabad, and very happy to be a part of this uh, <coughs> rapid revision. And uh, today, so straightforwardly, without wasting any time, we will be uh, forwarding to uh, to start our uh, revision, rapid revision of your ENT. Right. So, ENT, you have three parts: ear, nose, and throat. Right. In first, we will be covering up the ear. Then we will be going up to the larynx, and then we will go to the nose, and then in the miscellaneous topics, we will start it later. So first, coming to the ear. So first, randomly, I will be briefly brushing up the anatomy initially, and along with the anatomy, that particular conditions which are are there, I will be discussing it there itself. So, for example, if we are talking about the ossicles of the middle ear, otosclerosis will be mentioned there itself. So, that you will be having, you are already, you have gone through the ENT and now this is a revision. So, so we will be <coughs> closing the topic there itself along with the anatomy itself. Okay. Hope you understood. So, someone has messaged visual not clear. Is the problem with everyone? Audio visual fine. Yeah, fine. So, okay. So, we are starting it. So, coming to the ear, right? So, you have got mainly in the ear, you have got mainly three parts, right? Of which there are one is your external ear right and the next one is middle ear and uh, the next one is inner ear or internal ear or we also call this we also called it uh, call it as labyrinth right middle ear is also called as tympanum okay right okay so coming to external ear again you have the ear pinna right pinna or auricle we call it as and you have external auditory canal and also you have tympanic membrane right and in the inner ear you will be having two parts bony labyrinth as well as membranous labyrinth the membranous labyrinth will be lying inside the bony labyrinth so we will be going through each and every structure one by one in sequence so coming to the ear pinna okay so coming to the ear pinna so see you can see this is the externally appearing part of your ear okay so that is directly visible that is your ear pinna on this ear pinna you can see many grooves and depressions and elevations okay each depression each elevation has got its own name right so this part the outside elevated part the external elevated part is called as your this is called as helix exactly inside to the helix oppositely one more elevation will be running this is your anti helix right okay and uh, here you will see a elevation this is called as tragus and exactly opposite to that you can see anti tragus also right so these are the main important things you should remember and this part where there is no cartilage only fat is located here this is called as lobule what is the significance of this lobule this lobule the fat present in the lobule is used as graft in some surgeries earlier in uh, ear the meringoplasty surgeries or tympanoplasty surgeries instead of temporal fascia some people used to have fat as their graft material 
okay and uh, the other main structure another structure here this part which appears as a depression this we call it as concha again the significance of concha and tragus is the cartilage from here can be the cartilage of tragus as well as the concha these can be used as the graft material for tympanoplasty or osseoplasty okay all these ear procedures you can take cartilage material from this area right so you can see the entire inside if you remove the skin over here the inside cartilage you can see the entire cartilage is a single it's a single piece okay not part and parcel it is a single piece of elastic cartilage yellow elastic cartilage okay remember this may be asked okay so this is a single yellow elastic cartilage that constitutes the entire cartilage of your ear pinna and here you can see an area where there is a defect in the cartilage this area is called as where there is a defect in the cartilage this area is called as incisura terminalis what is the significance of this incisura terminalis okay so in incisura terminalis through this incising here you can enter into the ear and you can uh, perform ear surgeries so this approach where you can approach the middle ear as well as mastoid through this incision that approach is called as lempert's endoral approach okay right so this is incisura through the incisura terminalis you the surgery performed the approach that you take through the incisura terminalis is called as lempert's endoral approach so this one is also an mcq right so coming to the so if this is clear we will be forwarding to the next slide okay so this is uh, coming to the development of your ear embryology of your ear okay coming to the development of ear pinna okay so you can see six hillocks of his will be forming first okay these six will be forming from first pharyngeal arch as well as second pharyngeal arch from the first pharyngeal arch only tragus will be developing from the first pharyngeal arch and the remaining will be developing from the second pharyngeal arch okay so you can see here this is the first arch and this is the second arch okay so in total six hillocks of his will be arising from these two arches and uh, so you can see the typical arrangement they undergo or uh, during development process and uh, only one will be developing into tragus the remaining all will be developing into your the remaining rest of the pinna this is the tragus and the other entire thing is developing from the second pharyngeal arch right so what happens during development sometimes there is a incomplete fusion between these two arches second arch and first arch so what happens this incomplete closure will lead to a defect in this area so that defect will be presenting as an external opening that is we call it as preauricular sinus right so what is preauricular sinus it is a congenital anomaly so it is a congenital anomaly that forms due to incomplete fusion of first and second arch structures so someone is asking pdf when it will be available so after the class the entire pdf or entire study material will be given to you separately you can just follow the class now try to understand the things okay so that first understand the things what's uh, what is what then after that you just go through the material that will give you then it will be clear for you okay so this is about the embryology of the ear right and uh, so coming to the congenital anomalies other congenital anomalies of the external ear you can see here there is no pinna here okay so this condition we call it as anosia 
and here you can see inappropriately developed external ear mildly developed mildly not developed so that is a very small external ear is present over here that we call it as microtia or the another name given for this is peanut ear okay other congenital condition you can see the upper part of the pinna is going and hiding beneath the skin you can see the upper one third of the pinna is going and hiding inside the skin this we call it as cryptosia crypto means hidden otic means ear so hidden ear that is cryptosia and this is bat ear or lop ear okay due to extra large development of your fourth arch so sorry fourth hillock of his this bat ear develops the ear will be instead of like this your ear will be wide opened so that is we call it as bat ear right and these are some of the congenital anomalies that we encounter commonly and also you can see your coloboma of the ear okay so coloboma is associated most of the times with charge syndrome so what is charge syndrome this c stands for coloboma right and h stands for heart defects whenever you encounter a ear like this you should be suspecting any heart defects and uh, any atresia of the nasal coena right any atresia or uh, ill development of the coena openings of the nose okay any other uh, renal renal abnormalities can be present as well as genito urinary abnormalities can be present over sometimes so these all are the components of your charge syndrome and uh, uh, sometimes you can see the extra skin development over here so extra skin will be present just skin without any underlying cartilage or bone or anything only the skin will be growing as an extra thing these we call it as pre auricular tags okay so these are some of the congenital anomalies that we come across usually coming to the other conditions of the ear pinna if you carefully observe the structure of the anatomical uh, the arrangement of the structures in the ear pinna you can see so one side skin will be there okay medial side and lateral side the skin will be there right and in the in between there will be cartilage right this is the cartilage right and on either side of the cartilage you can notice a perichondrium wherever there is a cartilage perichondrium will be covering it periosteum means that is covering the the layer that is covering the bone here it is cartilage in the ear pinna it is cartilage and surrounding the cartilage on either side you will be having a perichondrium outside to the perichondrium on the medial side you will be having a only skin no subcutaneous soft tissue on the other side you will be having subcutaneous soft tissue over which the skin will be lying okay so if you pass from outside to inside see outside skin will be there under that subcutaneous soft tissue will be there connective tissue and inside to it perichondrium inside to it cartilage and again if you go towards the other side again perichondrium and the skin will be there so these are the linearly arrangement of your structures in the ear pinna right so what is this hematoma of auricle okay have you heard hematoma of the auricle so what is exactly is this hematoma is that in between the cartilage and its perichondrium there will be collection of your there will be collection of the blood inside okay that we call it as hematoma collection of blood between cartilage and perichondrium is called as hematoma see you see so in the center there will be cartilage and lining to it on either side will be perichondrium okay this is perichondrium and outside to it will be lying your skin right so this is skin so anywhere here on either on the lateral side or on the medial side if there is any collection of the blood here what happens 
it will swell outside and as you know the perichondrium is a tightly attached structure to the cartilage the a very minimal or little collection in this area will cause a lot of pain to the patient there will be severe excruciating pain to the patient so he will be complaining of excessive pain and you can notice a swelling and typically a history of trauma will be given by the patient okay like you can see in boxers okay okay where in boxing okay the, this area is more prone to get injured right so any uh, rta cases okay so you can see a, a trauma history very clearly in these cases where you can notice the swellings huh? so if in time this is drained okay the treatment of uh, this thing will be this uh, hematoma will be immediate incision and drainage combined with pressure dressing okay why pressure dressing to avoid again the collection okay repeated collection okay so incision and drainage give an incision here give an incision here open it up drain all the fluid out and apply a tight pressure banding okay tight pressure bandage like this okay so it will keep up it closed and it will not allow any further collection to occur inside so that there won't be any recurrence if it is not treated properly immediately if this issue is not addressed properly what happens due to the pressure by the hematoma on the cartilage what happens the cartilage get necrosed okay if inappropriate treatment if treated inappropriately or incompletely there will be pressure necrosis of the cartilage okay so due to this pressure necrosis what happens a part of your uh, wherever there is pressure on the cartilage that part of the cartilage gets dissolved so what happens if one area in one area if there is a uh, cartilage is gone in one area in the entire single piece of your yellow elastic cartilage if one area is gone your ear will get deformed okay so likewise if there are multiple hematomas multiple deformations can occur and ultimately your ear may look like a cauliflower so we call it as a cauliflower ear okay or we also call it as a boxer's ear or we also call it as a pugilistic ear why pugilistic ear because after okay uh, after death Pugilism will be the there will be a pugilistic attitude of the body will be there where mummification all the things will occur and the deformation of the tissue will be occurring so that that's why this name is given it just looks like a mummified body so this is pugilistic ear or most commonly this is seen in boxers so we also call it as boxers ear and uh, this will resemble uh, the appearance of a cauliflower we also call it as a cauliflower ear or boxers ear or pugilistic ear so this is all about hematoma even in cases of perichondritis also even in cases of perichondritis also there will be the same problem will be there instead of serious perichondritis we call instead of blood in hematoma blood will be accumulating in serious perichondritis some serous effusion will be accumulating over here again the pathophysiology will be the same as this there will be pressure necrosis if treated inappropriately or proper treatment should be incision and drainage with pressure bandaging right this is pressure bandaging is most important to prevent recurrence and coming to the next thing keloid many of you might have noticed very frequently these keloids in your clinical uh, postings this keloids most commonly this main reason of this keloids is due to piercing ear inappropriate ear piercing okay so everyone following any problem kindly let me know or your moderator who is also online you can let them know any problem is there okay so keloid due to piercing okay most common is due to piercing again trauma is also one of the known causes okay that is piercing trauma is the most common here okay so in this what happens excessive collagen and fibrogen fibrin deposits occur excessive collagen and fibrin deposits will happen here due to continuous stimulation of the traumatized area 
So what happens? The tissue will keep on accumulating over here and it will be coming as a uh, swelling over here. So one person is asking the uh, video is not clear. Uh, Dr. Slok Mandal. I think you can uh, just check your internet connection, Dr. Vance. Your internet may not be that much. We just check once because all others are saying it is clear. Okay. And uh, excessive collagen and fibrosis deposits will occur here. And uh, so the treatment for this keloid is excision. First of all, you excise the keloid. Okay. Excise it. Okay. And uh, remove the uh, content. Okay. Excision. And uh, followed by. The most common complaint given by many patients of keloid is recurrence. Recurrence is the most common complaint complained by most of the patients. So to prevent recurrence, what is usually done is you can apply mitomycin, mitomycin antimitotic agent there or if it is not available to prevent the collagen deposition, you can give a corticosteroid injection as well as hyaluronidase injection. This hyaluronidase, hyaluronidase injection, this will, this enzyme will uh, digest the, uh, the connective tissue getting deposited over there along with to suppress the inflammatory reaction, you can give uh, any kenacot or any triamcinolone injection you can give. Okay. So, these combination injections are given locally to avoid recurrence, okay, frequently. So, this is also a, this can also be an MCQ, okay. So, to prevent a recurrence of the keloid, repeated injections of weekly doses of hyaluronidase and triamcinolone injections can be given. The most appropriate treatment is just excision and to prevent a recurrence, you should be giving this hyaluronidase and triamcinolone. Okay, so this is all about your keloid. Also, nowadays the geni genetic factors are also found to play a role in keloid formation. Some people are only having these tendencies. Okay, so you can, this may be, this, till now this was not asked, this may be asked later on. Keloid and coming to the, so these are all your ear pinna malformations. Okay, hope the pinna part is over. So you have studied about its anatomy. Okay, the parts, what it is made up of, clinical significance of this incisural terminalis, right? And you can see development. During development, hillocks office. So this is important, hillocks office. How many hillocks office may be formed? Six hillocks office. So the first arch. So these six hillocks office will be formed from first and second, of which only tragus develops from the first arch, rest of the pinna develops from the second arch. Incomplete fusion between these two, okay, between the first and the other remaining, there will be a deficiency. That deficiency will be elicited as opening outside that we call it as preauricular sinus. The treatment for preauricular sinus is if there is no discharge, if there is no discharge, it's just that appears as it is just appearing as an opening, leave it as such, no active management required. But if it is getting repeatedly infected, repeatedly if it is getting infected, then you have to go for surgical excision of the entire sinus tract. So you know the difference between a sinus and a fistula, right? Sinus means only one opening, fistula means on both openings. If you see outside, the sinus will be appearing as a simple opening. But if you see inside, so it will be having a multiple tracks outside inside and each one will be connecting to each other like this so it will be distributed inside like this so while surgery what you do you pour methylene blue dye and that dye will be passing through the entire tract wherever that dye goes we will be dissecting surrounding part the entire surrounding part of the connective tissue will be dissected completely and outside also and then this side skin and that side skin will be sutured Right? So that is how the preauricular sinus will be treated. Only surgical excision of the preauricular sinus is done only if it is getting repeatedly infected. If there is no pus, no discharge from the sinus, you can leave it as such. No active management required. And these are few congenital abnormalities. You know, remember the uh, abbreviation of the coloboma and also 
coming to the hematoma this uh, cauliflower ear may be asked so just know exactly what's happening in the hematoma in between the cartilage and its perichondrium this is important where exactly the hematoma is happening the collection fluid collection is happening that is in between the cartilage and its perichondrium okay and coming to the next part that is keloid this is due to in, uh, inappropriate piercing or trauma cases you can notice this keloid due to excessive collagen deposition treatment is excision and to avoid recurrence weekly doses of hyaluronidase and triamcinolone will be given so now we will be going to the nerve supply of pinna so coming to the nerve supply of pinna you can see the majority of the ear pinna is supplied by greater auricular nerve the name itself speaks out greater auricular nerve so as this nerve is supplying the most part of the auricle so more, more part of the auricle that's why it is called as greater and it is supplying the auricle so that's why it is greater auricular nerve or the nerve that is supplying most part of the auricle okay greater auricular you can see the violet colored part this entire violet colored part is supplied by your greater auricular nerve okay gal right on the lateral surface you can see most of the posterior part of the auricle is supplied by your greater auricular nerve and most of the medial part of your here yeah, that is the back side of your pinna that is the medial surface of your pinna is supplied by your greater auricular nerve right clear and this part the anterior superior part on the lateral surface this part is supplied by your auriculotemporal nerve auriculotemporal nerve v3 that is of v means this is five actually roman five trigeminal and the trigeminal have got three branches that's why it is trigeminal and the third branch is your mandibular so from the mandibular this auriculotemporal nerve comes you can see this is the mandibular joint right temporomandibular joint right just besides it is the area this is the anterior superior area of the pinna is there so this nerve supplying here in the mandible area it also comes a bit posterior and supplies this part so no need to by heart this each and every part just remember okay so auriculotemporal nerve so that is temporal as well as auricular that's why it is named as auriculotemporal nerve it is supplying the temporal area as well as your auricular area anterior superior part of your auricle just besides the temporal region okay this entire thing is a temporal region and this is the temporal mandibular joint so in this area your auriculotemporal nerve will be supplied so that's why coming to the auricle part the anterior superior part of the auricle will be supplied by the same nerve right you can remember in that way it will be very easy for you to remember no need to buy heart and also coming to the center concha part of the auricle right or on the medial surface if you if you see these two areas this this area the on the lateral side corresponds to this area on the medial side this area is supplied by your seventh facial nerve branches as well as vagus nerve branches the auricular branch of the vagus we call it as auricular branch of the vagus the another name for this nerve is arnold's nerve so someone is asking name for fibroids uh, this is not uh, this i can fibroids are not concerned with ent okay so this is auricular branch of the vagus arnold's nerve we call it uh, we also call it as arnold's nerve right okay so in this green part you can see this area on the lateral side the concha part if you take the pinna this is the concha part and uh, the on the medial surface of it will be corresponding to this area so this area will be supplied by your auricular branch of the vagus also called as arnold's nerve so now and the upper part this on the medial surface on the uh, uh the upper part of the medial surface superior to the portion of the medial surface of the pinna this part will be sub uh, lying near to the occipital area so this is supplied by lesser occipital nerve okay so if you remember these three auriculotemporal nerve because it is lying near to the temporal area auriculotemporal nerve which is a branch of the mandibular nerve which again is a branch of your trigeminal okay this is supplying the anterior superior part of the auricle and the concha part as well as the medial surface uh, this part this area is supplied by your facial as well as 
uh, Arnold's nerve branches and uh, the posterior, the on the medial surface, on the superior part, the lesser occipital will be supplied. So, <coughs> excluding all these three supplying areas, if you take the entire remaining area, so that will be supplied by your greater auricular nerve, right? So, another significance of this <coughs> greater auricular nerve, sometimes this uh, nerve will be taken as a graft material for uh, reconstructing the facial nerve. Sometimes you can see facial nerve trauma will be there where if the facial nerve is going in the facial canal inside the mastoid, if there is any transection of the facial nerve due to either due to cholesteatoma, some part is damaged or due to trauma, it is uh, some part of the facial nerve is gone and the patient has presented to you with facial palsy. So, to reconstruct in between, to interlay the uh, to maintain the continuity between the two parts of the uh, severed graft, we take a graft from, we take a part of the greater auricular nerve and we place it uh, near to the, in between the, in the damaged portion, we remove the damaged portion and we place it in between these uh, two severed normal ends, okay. So that it will heal and again the continuity will be maintained and the facial palsy can be resolved to these patients. Well, this is possible only when there is a uh, the other sites are functionally intact okay and uh, so why the greater auricular nerve will be selected is that this greater auricular nerve is located very near to the facial nerve one thing and the diameter the width the thickness of this uh, nerve almost coincides with that of the thickness of the facial nerve so one reason is thickness is almost similar to that of the facial nerve and it is the locality this is nearby located located very nearby to your facial nerve so these two are the reasons why greater auricular nerve will be selected as a graft for facial nerve interposition okay right so i think the nerve supply is over now coming to their extra ear anatomy external ear canal the pinna part is over so, okay, I am concluding the pinna part and now I am entering into the next part of the external ear that is your external auditory canal, right? So, this is your external auditory canal. You can see this is your external auditory canal. The most important MCQ, this is how much millimeter long? This is 24 millimeter long and you can see outer 8 mm is cartilaginous and inner 16 millimeters is bony right okay this is your external auditory canal same way you can get confused with eustachian tube length also okay eustachian tube will be 36 millimeter in length and uh, the inner 12 mm will be bony and the sorry outer 12 mm will be bony and the inner 12 mm will be cartilaginous okay so this is divided in the 1 is to 2 ratio same here this is also divided in the 1 is to 2 ratio. So both are same. This is the only thing is the outer thing is cartilaginous here. In the external auditory canal, the outer part is cartilaginous and the inner part is bony. If it is, if you are finding it difficult to remember, if you are getting confused repeatedly, just simply understand one part. See your, this is your cartilaginous part and this is continuing into your ear canal. So, this cartilage is straightly continuing into your ear canal like that in the same way. So, this is cartilage so that the inner lying area uh, part of the external artery canal is also made up of the continuous cartilage and this cartilage is attached to the inner bony part. Okay, where that bone is part of which bone of your skull bone? This bone, this entire bony part. See, this is a part of your temporal bone, right? Your ear completely, your ear apparatus is lodged inside the temporal bone right so the inside the canal will be continuing like this and you can see the middle ear you can see the middle ear it is being continued as a middle ear and you can see the bone will be continuing as a eustachian tube to some part inside right from there again so if you see this is the external auditory canal so if this is the external auditory canal here you have tympanic membrane and this is your middle ear right in the middle ear, this is your uh, the uh, eustachian tube, right? If you take the cartilaginous part, 
So outside this cartilage will be attached to your pinna, right? Inside this cartilage will be opening into your nasal cavity, nasopharynx, right? And the opposite side again another one. So this is nasopharynx area. Eustachian tube is the structure that connects to your middle ear as well as nasopharynx, right? So if you have any confusion, see this is outside, right? Okay. And this is inside, right? You are going in, inside, from outside to inside. If you take the external auditory canal, the outer part is cartilaginous and the inner part is bony. And in case of eustachian tube, the outer part is bony and the inner part is cartilaginous. Wherever you get doubt, you just uh, uh, apply the ratio, 1 is to 2 ratio here. So as this is 24 mm in length, you will get 8 mm and this is 16 mm bony part. And here, this is 12 mm and 24 mm. I think you understood how to remember the dimensions of external auditory canal and eustachian tube. Okay. If you remember the anatomy like this, it will be easy to understand. Hope you are all, uh, you all are getting this, right? Right? Clear? So, now coming to the, uh, in this external auditory canal, you can see some openings will be microscopic openings will be present over here okay so these are not visible to the naked eye so microscopic openings will be present so these are called as fissures of santorini okay fissures of santorini as well as okay foramen of hashki will also be there here in this area okay so, fissures of Santorini or foramen of Hushki will be there. So, to what is the significance of these openings is any external ear canal infections, they can easily pass into the underlying parotid area as well as temporomandibular joint area. So, they can cause infections to and fro. Also, any parotid infections also can transmit and cause external otitis. So, okay. So, whenever a patient is complaining of parotitis and also at that time, Clinically, you should examine the ear also and if there is any infection inside, you should give appropriate treatment for that. Okay. So, coming to the next one. So, these are the pathologies that occur in the external auditory canal. So, what are all the pathologies that you can see? Mostly, you see, as you all know, so this is your ear pin now and this is your external auditory canal and this is the cartilaginous part and this is the bony part. Here, inside your ear, you can see hair over here. You can, uh, you can see your ear and outside there will be hair present over here. So, this hair, the hair follicle inside it here, there will be hair follicles inside. If these hair follicles get infected, what happens here, there will be pus accumulation and it will come as a swelling and it will be lying over here. So, this we call it as furuncle. Okay or furunculosis. You can see over here, this is called as furuncle. These furuncles will lie only in the outer cartilaginous part where hair is present because furuncle itself means this is nothing but infection of hair follicle. Okay. So, this is infection of your hair follicle. That we call it as furuncle or furunculosis of external auditory canal. The organism that causes this infection is Staphylococcus aureus. Okay. So, you give the first treatment, what will you give? Some people recommend ichthamol glycerin packs as a treatment, but practically in clinical practice, these are not available outside. So, what you will do, you will go for an anti staphylococcal antibiotics like so penicillins or any uh, cephalosporins you will give. Local antibiotic ultimates, you will ask the patient to apply, some painkillers will be given. So, and anti-inflammatory agents will be given. So, that will be fine. The patient will be fine. So, these are, this is what is called as furunculosis. In simple line, it can be mentioned as staphylococcal infection of the hair follicle in the outer cartilaginous part of the EAC, right? This is, uh, as there is an infection and inflammation over there, patient will be complaining of pain over here, right? And if you come to the other tumors in the external auditory canal, you can see if you see a one single swelling in the bony part, okay, 
If you see one single swelling in the bony part, possibly it could be osteoma. If it is on palpation, if it is hard to feel, so that we call it as osteoma. Osteomas are usually single, okay. You can see only single swelling in the ear canal. You can see a single swelling, a single bony swelling in the ear canal. These are, this is called as osteoma as well as uh, if you see multiple small swellings in the bony part of the external auditory canal, we call it as exostosis, right? Okay, so exostosis are multiple small swellings in the bony part of the ESC, okay? So these two occur in the, these two exostosis, okay? So exostosis as well as osteoma. Okay, osteoma. This will be occurring in the bony part of the external auditory canal. So exostosis will be small and multiple in occurrence. Okay. So here your tympanic membrane will be lying, and this is your middle ear will be. Okay. So this exostosis is most commonly seen in surfers. Okay, where the <coughs> the egg there is constant exposure of the ear canal to the cold water constant exposure of external auditory canal to the cold water wherever it is present they those people are more prone to get these small bony swellings this bony swelling will develop from the surrounding bony part of the external auditory canal only from this bone only they will be developing the treatment for osteoma and uh, uh, this is exostosis is excision only okay simple excision will be enough Okay, they won't be painful. Osteoma and exostosis are painless. Okay, remember the difference. If you see any single swelling in the external auditory canal in the cartilaginous area, that could be furuncal, and patient will also be complaining of the pain. Then antibiotics, anti-inflammatories will be the treatment option. And if you see any single swelling, occluding the lumen of the canal in the bony part, that could be osteoma. And uh, if you see multiple small swellings, that could be exostosis. These two are painless and most often these are only incidental findings. The only problem with the osteoma as well as exostosis, what happens is the ear wax gets accumulated inside. This bony swellings will obstruct the normal migration of the wax as well as epithelial cells outside. And what happens, the patient will come to you with a complaint of uh, ear block sensation. When you, when you see with the otoscope or endoscope, you will see a bony swelling and behind the bony swelling inside, like inside their wax will be accumulated over here entirely completely. Okay, and this osteoma will be obstructing the, the normal migration of the squamous epithelium as well as the all the wax outside. So this will be blocking the normal migration and all you can see keratin and all debris will be accumulated inside and it's also difficult to, to clean. So most commonly we advise for excision of the osteoma with clearance of the debris as well as wax as well as keratin everything there. Clear? So single swelling in the cartilaginous part, furuncal, single swelling in the bony part, osteoma, multiple swelling in the bony part, exostosis. Done. So next we'll move on to the next part that is your pautomycosis. Okay. Fungal infection of the. Okay. Otomycosis, this is fungal infection of your ear canal. Okay, so most common organism here is your Aspergillus niger. Okay, Aspergillus niger is the most common organism that causes your otomycosis. It is seen as black filamentous heads. Okay, black filamentous heads will be seen on otoscopy, right. If it is white, next to most common organism is candida, which occurs as white creamy deposits. Okay, white creamy deposit can be seen. So this you can see it as a candida and this is Aspergillus niger. Okay, clear? So most common organisms will be these two. Otomycosis, the most common etiology is earbud usage. Unnecessary people will be using earbuds most commonly and uh, 
if they are even diabetic the most commonly these are also seen in diabetic people okay those who have uncontrolled diabetics there will be okay this automycosis will be seen most commonly uncontrolled diabetic people always putting the earbuds inside and uh, they will cause their own ear to get infected and we can see very clearly you can see the black filamentous heads or candida in those people and the treatment for this is if you are seeing black filamentous heads go for itraconazole okay itraconazole will be a better option and also first you have to do oral toileting that means ear cleaning okay first completely remove the debris okay remove the debris from the ear canal make it clean wash with spirit or any alcohol based uh, hand rub or anything and after that give antifungal medication vitraconazole and also if you find uh, uh, candida you can go for clotrimazole also or only candida if you are saying you can also go for systemic fluconazole also and local drops that contains antifungal as well as uh, this painkillers can be given most of the otomycosis patients will also complain of pain okay so also give them some painkillers with anti-inflammatory so diclofenac aciclofenac those will be enough okay so that will be enough in the most of the cases this is all about otomycosis right so we'll move on to the next condition that is ramsey hunt syndrome or herpes zoster oticus that is the organism causing this is herpes zoster and it is causing ear infection so that is why it is herpes zoster oticus we also call this is ramsey hunt syndrome they described this syndrome first initially okay so in he here you can see much vesicles over the pinna mostly on the conca area and also in the external auditory canal patients will be complaining of pain okay sometimes most of the patients will be complaining apart from vesicles and rash okay apart from vesicles and rash patients will be complaining of pain also right and uh, apart from that in few cases or rarely you can notice sensory neural hearing loss and also you can also notice Sometimes in rare cases, apart from sensory neural hearing loss, you can also notice facial nerve palsy. Okay. Mostly, if you take the ear canal from the, if you see from outside, the posterior part will be mostly getting uh, this uh, infected rashes and uh, all those vesicles will be seen on the posterior part. See on this, in the, if you come to the pinna, they will be seen on this conca area mostly. You can see the other part of the pinna is fine. You can see the nerve supply of this area is by your facial nerve, right? If you remember in the earlier slides, what we have seen is the conca area, we have seen the conca area is supplied by the seventh nerve, facial nerve, as well as your tenth nerve, right? Okay. So, so any uh, uh, spread from these fibers along with these fibers, if the virus spreads from this area towards the facial nerve inside then the patient may even complain of facial nerve palsy so the treatment is start steroids immediately corticosteroids prednisolone or methylprednisolone immediately and you can steroids and also acyclovir antiviral okay antiviral that's acyclovir or valaciclovir or gansiclovir can be given okay many studies uh, say that steroids are must but acyclovir can or may or may not be beneficial okay so so there are many trials conducted comparing the steroids alone as well as steroids plus acyclovir in all those studies it was found that there was no significant difference noticed when steroids alone were given as well as steroids and acyclovir both combined were given so even if you combine acyclovir or not that doesn't matter but steroids are must. These are the best first line management for this uh, treatment. You start with the four. Uh, this one. If you go, if you are going for uh, methylprednisolone or uh, this uh, methylpred, okay, methylprednisolone. If you are going, 
we we'll start with usually 16 mg we go for BD initially and then we go for 8 mg BD later on and then we go for 4 mg BD later on. So then when tapering dosage we will be given one week, one week, one week like that we will be tapering the dosage of this methylprednisolone, right? Acyclovir can be given either 4 to 5 times or okay, 4 to 5 times a day, okay? That is for at least 7 days you need to give like that, right? So these are the main important and if there is any pain complained by the patient, you can go for any other painkillers, etc. Okay. But remember, the most important first line, front line management is always steroids. The more early you start the treatment, the better the outcome will be. If you delay it, then there will be permanent uh, derangement, right? And then coming to another most important MCQ wise important topic is malignant otitis externa here okay so malignant otitis externa i'm sorry i'm forgetting that this acha this column is not visible okay here you get a video column i forgot okay so i'm sorry i'll be writing it on the top column only so this is malignant otitis externa okay so in the malignant otitis externa as the name suggests, it is uh, malignant, but in fact, this is not malignant. It is a misnomer. It is not malignant. Okay. It behaves like a malignant. Okay. It only just behaves like a malignancy. That's why it is called as malignant otitis external. Right. Clear. But it is not a malignant condition. Malignant otitis external is a benign condition okay it is a simple otitis externa but it only differs in the causative organism the causative organism here is pseudomonas aeruginosa the pseudomonas is a highly uh, very active organism okay highly dangerous organism it behaves like a malignant tumor and it starts spreading into the your bony. So you see if this is your ear pinna and this is your external auditory canal, once there is a otitis external over here, it will start infecting your canal lining, the skin of the canal, as well as it will invade into the bony part also and starts. What happens whenever there is infection in the bony and the canal connective tissue area, immediately the granulation tissue starts forming and it will be filling in the auditory canal part. Okay. So that is how. Well, you see, whenever you examine these cases, in few cases, you can see a granulation tissue appearing in the external artery canal. Patient will be complaining of severe pain. Granulation tissue will be present, but it's not compulsory that you see. Most of the times, pain will be the severe pain will be complained by the patient. And you can see, if not granulation tissue, you can definitely see the edematous external auditory canal in these conditions. So, immediate treatment is clear whatever the debris you see over here in the ear canal, what all debris you see, clear them, try to clear them. And uh, anti pseudomonal, sorry, anti pseudomonal, anti pseudomonal antibiotics, okay, anti pseudomonal antibiotics, of which the ceftazidine is the first line okay if you are not sure whenever a patient to you comes with otitis externa and you are not sure what possibly there may be uh, just take the history while taking history if the patient is complaining of any immunosuppressive conditions like your diabetes most commonly we see in our surroundings we see diabetic patients uncontrolled diabetic coming with ear pains first suspect pseudomonas that is your malignant otitis externa Take an ear swab and send it for culture and sensitivity. Randomly empirical antibiotic you should start. And once you start an empirical antibiotic, within two days you will get the uh, culture report. And if there is pseudomonas, immediately shift to specific anti-pseudomonal antibiotic which is sensitive. And then that will be fine. Sometimes irreparable damage can occur sometimes. All the canal wall gets damaged. Uh, so once the active infection is subsided by medical management, you may have to debride the complete necrotic material. All the damaged part you may have to surgically remove. Sometimes surgical debridement also may be necessary 
in these cases depending on the extent of damage the more early you start the treatment and also control of diabetic okay okay diabetes control of diabetes is very much important in these cases uncontrolled diabetics the chances of uh, the resolution are very less okay so apart from this treatment parallelly anti-diabetic treatment should also be taken care of so this is all about malignant otitis external right most commonly seen in in first of all it is not a malignant it is a benign condition it is like simple a otitis externa only but the organism here that is causing is pseudomonas which is highly virulent and uh, that the damage is very fast it behaves like a cancer which spreads to the surrounding tissues very fast so this damage can cause severe pain to the patient to discharge pain and foul smelling discharge to the from the patient because once this bone gets damaged uh, we call it as osteomyelitis okay okay where the bone gets infected osteomyelitis so we also call this condition as skull base osteomyelitis because just above this ear canal bony part of the ear canal and this you all have a brain right so this is the partition between your brain and ear only right so this is for forms a part of your so this forms a partition bone between your skull as well as face right cranium and face so this is also called as skull base osteomyelitis right okay so which is very dangerous condition so better to treat it as early as possible and as uh, rapidly as possible right and uh, so if there is severe infection sometimes surgical debridement necrotic tissue needs to be removed uh, and also uh, uh, the treatment should be focused on uh, proper anti pseudomonal antibiotics like ceftazidime right so i'm going to the next condition that is your keratosis obturans okay okay keratosis obturans means simple see again your pinna you have your external auditory canal ear um, drum tympanic membrane inside you have your middle ear right see what happens normally naturally uh, you if you take your tympanic membrane if you see its cross section it will be formed of three layers right tympanic membrane is formed of three layers right of which the outer layer is nothing but your squamous epithelial layer right okay squamous epithelial layer the outer layer is squamous epithelial layer middle layer is fibrous layer formed by mesoda inner layer will be mucosa okay mucosa layer formed by endoderm so that's why tympanic membrane is formed of three genetic layers right embryological layers so this squamous epithelium lining so that is the entire lining of the skin canal the squamous epithelium okay so here what happens from the center towards the periphery okay all the squamous epithelium the new squamous epithelium will form here and the old squamous epithelium will be migrating towards outward okay will be migrating outwards and they will fall off without your notice right while you are jumping moving turning this is the normal migration mechanism the old cells will be moving like this and the new cells will be forming over here okay so over here a new cells will be forming and old cells will be uh, migrating outward okay so this is the normal migration mechanism normal migration mechanism that happens in the ear canal okay in some cases some due to some genetic defects this migrating mechanism is lost in few cases and what happens the entire the old uh, epithelial cells and the keratin the that is uh, secreted by these epithelial cells okay the keratin as well as old dead epithelial cells okay all old dead epithelial cells and along with that you will be having wax over here right wax will be forming over here all those wax secretions everything they will be all painted up inside and they will be occluding the ear canal completely right so if you take this uh, complete ear canal this uh, uh, material and if you examine under a microscope you will be seeing a keratin mostly and uh, epithelial cells old dead epithelial cells will be seen and wax which is formed by your ceruminous glands as well as sebaceous glands all the sebum cerumen will be present over here and the dead hair cells will also be present this or the denuded hair will also be a part of the wax over here 
so that is the uh, the occlusion of the ear canal completely occlusion of the ear canal or obstruction of the ear canal completely by formation of the keratin due to genetic abnormality of the loss of the normal migrating mechanism so that obstruction obstruction of the ear canal due to keratin that condition we call it as keratosis obturans okay so never by heart any condition try to understand what exactly it is and try to know the normal mechanisms the pathologic conditions will be remembered easily if you try to understand and uh, remember the normal mechanisms normal anatomy normal physiology normal pathology so uh, uh, undoubtedly obviously you can easily remember the pathologic conditions right diseases disorders will be easy to remember and you also will get an idea on how to treat them okay so as this ear canal is occluded completely you have to because this eardrum is getting obstructed right okay the sound waves won't be able to pass inside patient will be complaining of hardness of hearing hoh hardness of hearing that is a impaired hearing right and also he will be complaining of ear block and there will be severe pain in this condition so these are the complaints given by most of these patients and the treatment is removal of the debris completely okay removal under possibly local anesthesia if not possible sometimes even we may have to remove it under general anesthesia okay so completely clearing of the debris completely from the ear canal that is what we should need to do right this is all about keratosis obturans right going to the another condition right okay so now we are moving on to the in uh, tympanic membrane okay hope you all are able to follow in case any doubts you can put it up in the chat box okay so tympanic membrane coming to the tympanic membrane so you know there are three layers of tympanic membrane so before going into already we have discussed the three layers of the tympanic membrane now we will go to the uh, this <coughs> the anatomy the structural landmarks of the tympanic membrane so this is the pictorial representation and whenever you put an endoscope inside you will see the eardrum like this you can correlate the structures very well over here so you can see the handle of malleus over here if you see from anterior part okay anteriorly if you see so pinna external auditory canal and here you can see the eardrum right and inside you can see a middle ear so into this eardrum the handle of malleus is inserted and above lies your head of the malleus right okay and uh, attached to this head of the malleus is your incus body short process long process of incus lenticular process of incus right and to this attached is your head of the stapes neck of the stapes posterior crura anterior crura foot plate of the stapes foot plate of the stapes will open into your your inner ear right which is a coiled structure right cochlea right so this is your inner ear hope you got the point how your ear apparatus is arranged so this handle of malleus which is inserted into the eardrum can be seen as a typical prominent landmark uh, whenever you see a your eardrum right so this is your handle of malleus right and this you can divide the eardrum into four quadrants based on this handle of malleus you draw a parallel line along the handle of malleus and a perpendicular line along this right so you get four quadrants of which where your cone of light lies is the antero uh, antero inferior quadrant and superiorly lies your antero superior quadrant if these two are anterior obviously these two are posterior so this is your posterior superior quadrant and this is your posterior inferior quadrant so never ever by heart the things so if you want to draw a eardrum this is right sided eardrum and this is left sided eardrum always note the handle of malleus like this okay it will be 
uh, visible like this this is right here this is left here and cone of light will be here and in this side cone of light will be here right and in past tensa part down part you will be having the annulus tympanicus which is absent in the past flaccida part that i will tell you now okay so whenever you want to diagrammatically represent a tympanic membrane you can represent it in this way okay it's so very simple representation so the four quadrants will be you draw a parallel line along the handle of malleus and a perpendicular line to it from the tip of the malleus so this divides it into four parts right this side also same in that way you can decide divide so this will be anterior superior anterior inferior posterior inferior posterior superior here it will be anterior superior anterior inferior posterior inferior posterior superior got it so this will be the divisions in case of right tympanic membrane and left tympanic membrane here the uh, diagram shown is of right tympanic membrane right so you can see a cone of light very clearly here if this is not what exactly is present every time there in order to see the tympanic membrane you focus a light whether it is endoscope or otoscope you put a light inside so that light will get reflected here okay so that light will get reflected reflected in this direction so that we call it as cone of light wherever you see it it is antero inferior quadrant and faintly you can see over here a long process of incus and the step is going inside okay so this part you can notice here in the posterior superior quadrant behind the posterior superior quadrant you can see the long process of incus and the, the step is crura and the step is foot plate over here right clear so the other structures you can see in the, the mainly you can see here the division of the ear right so this down part is pars tensa and this upper part is pars flaccida this part is pars flaccida okay so what is the difference between pars tensa and pars flaccida pars tensa has three layers whereas pars flaccida has only two layers you know already tympanic membrane comprises of three layers outer epithelial layer inner mucosal layer and middle fibrous layer right so this middle fibrous layer is absent in case of pars flaccida the middle layer is absent okay so remember this is an mcq why pars flaccida is thin means there are only two layers in the pars flaccida okay pars flaccida area where pars flaccida is present we call this area also as attic okay we call this area is also attic okay as the tympanic membrane is weak over here it has got only two layers so this area is prone to get retracted easily in case there is negative pressure in case there is negative pressure in the middle layer of the entire tympanic membrane the pars flaccida is a very weaker area due to is only two layers and this is the commonest part that can easily get retracted inward right so just remember that part while discussing cholesteatoma this uh, uh, this point is very important okay okay fine so past tensa and past flaccida right done okay so uh, i'm sorry so coming to the eardrum so this is the uh, uh, you have two divisions past flaccida past tensa this is the handle of malleus this is the cone of light and uh, so remaining structures to be discussed here is the annulus okay so this thick end peripheral part in the pars tensa is the annulus okay you can see over here this is the annulus okay the thick end peripheral part is the annulus remember okay annulus is nothing but the fibrous layer in the peripheral area in the peripheral part the fibrous layer gets thickened and gets tightly attached to your uh, ear canal okay so this thickened part we can see as a thickened layer on the periphery that we call it as a uh, annulus annulus is present in pars tensa only not in pars flaccida okay right so that's why whenever you draw a diagram of the tympanic membrane so you may represent the handle of malleus cone of light and you represent the annulus in the pars tensa part only not in the pars flaccida part 
hope you have got the anatomical landmarks and anatomical divisions of the tympanic membrane right and now uh, if this is clear we will move on to the next part so perforations of the tympanic membrane okay okay perforations can be traumatic or infective okay traumatic can occur anywhere infective perforations in case of infect perforations you have multiple one is central perforation subtotal perforation and one thing is you have marginal perforations another thing is you have attic perforations and another thing you have total perforations right yeah someone is asking for notes huh? definitely after the class uh, i will try to give you the notes also okay so no need to worry about that and uh, uh, shall we take a small break just five minutes break so that we will continue with the next portion of the year